and good evening, Santa Cruz County. My name is Sandino Gomez. This is Community Television's longest running uh, talk television show, Voices from the Village. Um, tonight we have a two out of three guests here. We're hoping uh, our third guest will arrive momentarily, but we have two really awesome guests regardless. And as you saw in the opening credits, tonight's um, topic is gonna be the civil rights struggle, kind of the relevance of today. And we're gonna look especially because of the recent holiday at the life and the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the amazing um, accomplishments and contributions that the gentleman was able to make to our nation's identity and our progress as a, uh, as a country striving to live up to the grand ideals held in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, which unfortunately, for a whole variety of reasons, have not always been lived up to. So we're uh, gonna pay special tribute to a man who did so much to um, hold the nation accountable and really forced a lot of people to look into their conscience around what was or was not fair when it came to talking about the American dream and kind of the, the structure of American society. Um, I guess with that, uh, we'll launch right into our guests. Often we have a segment where we hear from you, um, a person on the street segment, but unfortunately we don't have that for you tonight, so we're just gonna launch uh, right into the conversation. We do have some other videos for you which we're gonna show a little bit later, but um, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, our two distinguished guests, Daryl Darling and David Anthony. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Daryl, you're a, a local political activist, a, a Methodist minister, as well as a keeper of the, the Darling House, a lovely bed and breakfast over on uh, Westcliff. Right. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for coming tonight and, and sharing. You bet. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. And um, sitting to Daryl's right is David Anthony, a UCSC um, history professor with a focus on African American studies as well as African history. Um, he's also uh, teaches a class and is, is specialized in uh, African cinema in particular. Um, he has a lot of other accomplishments and work that he's done internationally in various struggles, particularly around South Africa and the anti apartheid, which we're going to get into a little bit. But I um, just want to say welcome to the show, Thank David. Thank you very much, Sandia. Um, <clears throat> Daryl, you had wanted to start with kind of a, a, a brief recap of civil rights, maybe define the term for us and, and explain a little bit of, of the, the relevant history. In right. We tend to think of civil rights primarily uh, in our own context in the United States, uh, by law, by economy, uh, et cetera. But, um, we really need to, we really understand civil rights, we understand the struggle, and we understand uh, the depth of the significance of it as we look at it in broad uh, perspective, uh, beginning, uh, <laughs> we could begin really from the, the real beginning, uh, which would have us recognize ourselves as uh, sophisticated amino acids. Uh, but here we are at the table, and uh, we'll begin with Genghis Khan, um, and leap forward to, uh, fast forward to uh, the Magna Carta, uh, which was the first major uh, grasp of power wrested from uh, a single source. Uh, the Again, fast forward to Thomas Jefferson uh, and the uh, f framers of the Constitution, uh, who uh, Jefferson, just a genius, recognizing or articulating uh, what is really difficult to state now in the same terms, but he said that men, all men are created equal, uh, endowed by the Creator, endowed. Uh, with inalienable rights. Uh, inalienable being like the skin. You skin off, take the skin off the human being, and, uh, and there's, <laughs> we're vulnerable. You can't really do yeah, that. You can't do that. Yeah. So uh, for, for him to use that phrase was uh, to recognize the essential humanity uh, and the rights of the person 
uh, as essential to our being, our very being. Uh, but it was still all men are created equal, and it really meant all white men, right. and it really meant all landed gentry. So uh, at the history of our nation in civil rights obviously has been uh, the process of redefining, refining what it was that Jefferson was talking about, uh, and so that he would understand as well. Uh, and that is, uh, again, a genius in, in our uh, humanity, a recognition of what our essential humanity, uh, Martin Luther King, Jr. And um, uh, King didn't really, um, in a sense, he didn't begin with civil rights. He began uh, with a reflection on uh, as from the perspective of a, a very well-educated, theologically well-grounded, biblically well-grounded uh, Baptist minister struggling with uh, the issues of uh, nonviolence, uh, a la Gandhi and, uh, and the South African experience. And, um, uh, and his, from the very beginning, uh, he, uh, identified with the civil rights movement and our, was the strongest articulator of the civil rights movement. But from the perspective of the three, what he identified right off the bat, I, uh, I was in Selma, Alabama, just before the, uh, the uh, Selma uh, march across the bridge, and two days before that, the, in between the two marches, the one that was aborted and the, the one that actually crossed the bridge, I, I was astounded uh, sitting in Brown's Chapel with, uh, we were just getting our marching orders for the day, and, and King said, this is just the beginning. When we've crossed that bridge, we've only be just begun. And I thought, of course, he's talking about civil rights. No. <laughs> he said, we still have the battle uh, uh, the, uh, of, on racism, on poverty, and on war. Those three. The triple evils is That's right. Them. The yeah. triple evils from the very beginning. Right. So, where we are now, and, and we'll, uh, we'll chat about that. that, about all the other uh, dimensions uh, globally and, and nationally and uh, of the various aspects of it. But, all, but the civil rights really are, are fundamental human rights. We don't understand them anything about civil rights without an understanding of our essential humanity in respect for that. Certainly, and, and leading into eventually a, a topic we're getting into, which is kind of the, the evolution of civil rights into human rights and right. the, the internationalization of right. human rights and, and kind of the freedoms and the concepts we take and hold so dear within American society and trying to hopefully uh, aspire to right. an international world community, world society. Um, David, any reactions to, to what you heard or any contributions you'd like to, to make there in, in terms of just talking about civil rights in general before we talk about some more specifics? Well, um, they all cover a lot of ground. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, I, I do find it interesting and, and ironic that we have to talk about Jefferson because Jefferson also epitomizes the great paradox. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who could be so clear, so eloquent, and so articulate in delineating what constituted the rights that needed to be protected, while also systematically defining a considerable portion of humanity out of that. Um, mm -hmm. And being a slave holder, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great irony in um, that. But that, uh, that doesn't mean that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Always a work in progress, right? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Um, I think what uh, one of the interesting dimensions of the question of civil rights is how it evolves over time um, as not only a national concern or let us say an Atlantic concern, but uh, a global concern, mm -hmm. so that by the time we get to the 20th century, we find that issues around civil rights also uh, dovetail with struggles for um, reform and eventually for uh, independence mm 
-hmm. in among peoples who have been uh, folded into the empires and colonized by other folks. Um, and that takes us into a number of other conversations. Uh, interestingly, um, if you look at the struggle for civil rights in this country, uh, it's actually a struggle that follows the arc of the question of slavery versus freedom. Mm -hmm. Going back to uh, the 19th century with the development of the abolition movement, which was not just a, an American movement, it was in fact a global movement, it was an Atlantic movement, it was a movement that really depended upon activity that unfolded in Europe and specifically in Britain because uh, what was called the humanitarian movement, which came into being in the last quarter of the 18th century, led to uh, emancipation in the British colonies uh, in 1833, mm -hmm. okay. which is three decades before it happens in this country. Mm -hmm. um, so that becomes an Atlantic conversation. Um, and then by the time that imperialism and colonialism take shape in the last quarter of the 19th century, you have a whole other set of uh, questions around civil rights, which we can eventually also talk about in terms of human rights, which are very complicated because they um, involve many different um, aspects. The other thing I think that's really intriguing is what we eventually talk about when we focus on civil rights um, in the United States tends more and more to be defined in terms of the particular position of people who are the descendants of slaves. Um, but it has implications for all kinds of people who mm -hmm. are oppressed uh, in the United States, by the United States, as well as outside by other powers. So you start to see these interesting parallels developing. So in 1909, you have the development of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, in the United States. Well, it turns out that some of the people who are involved in that movement are also inspiring and in conversation with people who are trying to build what is, in fact, the first African uh, liberation movement. Uh, the what was initially called the Native National Congress, which later on comes to be known as the African National Congress. Two years after the founding of the NAACP, three years after the founding of the NAACP, um, they create the African National Congress. Um, and this sort of dialogue on a kind of transnational basis uh, of two movements that are fighting for, again, first, democratic rights, uh, simply uh, extending the basis of democracy. Um, in the case of the United States, it's a matter of making the words of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution apply to everyone. Actually mm -hmm. means something, yeah. Um, in the case of South Africa, it's in fact um, to recognize the great um, limit of South African democracy, which was a racialized democracy. It was a democracy for whites only. And in fact, cut out 85% uh, of the population. Mm -hmm. So, but the fact that, that these two movements are developing simultaneously, in parallel, and in contact with one another, I think is an indication of a global consciousness mm -hmm. that occurs uh, throughout well, then the 20th century. Um, if anything, so the, the United States is trying to catch up in a lot of ways. In some ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. And, and certainly because of the history of immigration in this country, perhaps a lot of these ideas were brought from other places here. Right. And, you know, it's not a uniquely American phenomenon, democracy, certainly. It it's goes and it's much ironic further that, back than that. Right. Very much. Ironic that, uh, that immigration uh, is the, uh, uh, our current uh, struggle, one of the major yeah. current struggles uh, of, um, of equality, our, our definition, and actualizing uh, equality. Certainly. <coughs> we, we, we were, well, not me per se, but 
you know, people were fighting to have a system that treated everyone equally, and yet here in the United States today, when we talk about immigrants, we talk about immigration, clearly there's a, a two-class society. There's those with papers and those without papers. And right. It's a very significant difference. Right. Uh, when you, uh, you mentioned, David, the, um, <clears throat> the parallel struggles, mm -hmm. there was also a parallel struggle about the same time, and unfortunately, for political reasons, it was uh, uh, thought that the two struggles couldn't move forward together, and that was the struggle for women's rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of the same people that were in that struggle uh, were advocates, obviously, for, uh, uh, for civil rights, for, uh, for black, uh, mm -hmm. and, and in the anti-slave movement. Mm -hmm. So, so <clears throat> uh, once again, we discover that, <laughs> that civil rights are much more broadly defined. We're still engaged in all of those mm -hmm. in a variety of, uh, of ways. We have not yet in this country as you're saying, uh, some Dino, uh, we've not yet passed the ERA, uh, Equal Rights Equal Amendment, rights amendment. Yes. Uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, uh, the definition. But we have binders full of women. Uh, that's right. <laughs> we have binders full of women, though. And we don't, we don't own slaves now. Yeah. But the definition of civil rights for uh, the one the presidential candidate who had uh, binders full of, uh, uh, of women's names and so on uh, is a quite different definition from, uh, uh, from our, what we would consider to be civil rights. But there, it's just what he's talking about and, what, and the, the whole concept of the, um, uh, of the one percent the upper one percent is nothing different from ownership, you know, chattel ownership of slaves. Mm -hmm. We have been fighting uh, the battle of slavery, of ownership of people uh, from the very beginning uh, when, when uh, debtors prison released, uh, released debtors prison uh, inmates were um, brought to Georgia, sent to, to uh, Australia, uh, and in different parts of, of the United St uh, what is now the United States. <laughs> Something you said right there really yeah. struck me. Um, it's interesting to note that I don't remember the particular number of the amendment of the Constitution, but the one that freed the slaves basically has this clause within it that says, you know, except in the case of incarceration. And right. it's like kind of important to point out, I think, the United States prison population as right. we talk about civil rights, as we talk about human rights, right. and sort of a, a systematic reaction to the civil rights movements, to the kind of social justice and liberation movements that we've seen. Um, you know, the, the, the Jim Crow laws right. have uh, become more sophisticated, perhaps. It's a, it's a it's worth noting that the United States has the highest percentage prison. per capita of, of prisoners and prison population, and um, you know, and the, here in the land of the, quote unquote freedom, and, and yet you look at who these people are in particular. Right. It's people of color. It's people That's that exactly used to be right. affected by these old systems of control that are now under an entirely new, Absolutely. more sophisticated system of control. I mean, so the, to, the whole concept of slavery, you know, that struggle yeah, is. Uh, yeah. is uh, it present with us as much as it was uh, at the time of the Civil War. Could you speak to that at all? I think you're making reference to the 13th Amendment. Yeah, 13th. Um, yes. Uh, as long as people have been around, some people have found ways to get other people to work for them for little or no compensation. Um, and. There are many ironies that go along with this. Uh, first is that the majority of people who came to this country came under some form of bond. Mm -hmm. It was not just people who came here from Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, many people came here as what were called redemptioners, indentured servants, uh, people who, whose freight uh, was paid in labor 
that they owed to to uh, labor agents, basically, uh, which had to be worked off over periods of three or five or seven years. And you know, we think about the the pilgrims, and we think about you know other groups of people who come here. But everybody didn't come here on the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that sometimes we get caught up in the web of words. Okay. Uh, and we talk about slaves and slavery as if we're referring to an institution that is so specific and so conditioned by time that mm -hmm. we, we miss things that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. We have a tremendous amount of trafficking yeah. all over the world, including the United States. We have people who work in sweatshops under the radar under conditions that are not very different from the conditions of slavery. People who are locked into factories, people who have mm -hmm. no protections legally, people uh, who have um, uh, long hours and unsafe circumstances and, and cannot negotiate mm -hmm. contracts and, and all kinds of other things. So the question of slavery and slaves is still an open question. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and in fact, there are people uh, all over the world who are being traded and who are being bought and sold uh, so that that's not just a matter of the past. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't remember the particular United Nations uh, organization that reported it, something like Special Commission on Human Trafficking, but they report that there are more slaves today than at right. any point in the history of the world. And, and I think your, your point is right. well taken that this is not something that is in the past. It's very much still relevant, and these struggles continue. It's right. Not, we like to pat ourselves on the back and think, oh, we, we got that problem solved. And what you, what you just said, David, likewise, <clears throat> is that the actual ownership is something that can, uh, can, uh, continues to exist. Right. But there are so many different ways that that's uh, that morphs, uh, that whole concept morphs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the current uh, anti-union uh, movement, the uh, curtailment of labor's rights, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the ownership of women's bodies, mm -hmm. control of women's bodies mm -hmm. by a governmental entity, um, so, gay rights, uh, abortion rights, etc. Uh, those are, are manifestations of the same mentality mm -hmm. and, so, and are institutionalized in, in some of the same ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, would you say we, uh, we shift gears a little bit and, okay. and look particularly at that uh, period of history where Martin Luther King really was active, where he was really kind of a leader in these struggles. And um, I do believe that we have a video clip. I, I know you mentioned Selma. Right. It's interesting that you did because we have a clip, uh, informative clip about that. Okay. So I believe we can cut to that uh, about now. And why don't we just watch this clip together and we'll come back and do some reactions. And I would like to also just talk about you guys as a particular history and involvement in, in these struggles. Okay. To the president's chagrin, demonstrations continued. In 1965, protests targeted Selma, Alabama, the seat of Dallas County, where fewer than 1% of eligible blacks were registered to vote. And where bully boy segregationist Sheriff Jim Clark and his deputized citizens posse rounded up civil rights activists using Gestapo tactics and cattle prods. Snake's John Lewis was among more than 2,000 demonstrators jailed in the first months of 1965. The Reverend C.T. Vivian, an organizer for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led the Selma campaign. We're willing to be beaten for democracy, and you misuse democracy in the street. 
You beat people bloody in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. You beat me in the side and then hide your blows. But go on. No, I don't we need to leave. We have come to register to vote. And you must realize that this is a national issue. It's not a Selma issue. It's not an Alabama issue. This is a national issue. Whenever anyone does not have the right to vote, then every man is hurt. I don't we need to leave. We have come to On the night of February 18th, state troopers savagely attacked Vivian and other demonstrators. In the chaos, a young man named Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot at point-blank range in what the local newspaper called a nightmare of state police stupidity. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician from governors on down who has fed his constituents the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. The tragedy galvanized the Selma voting rights campaign. SCLC's James Bevel proposed a symbolic march from Selma to the Alabama state capitol in Montgomery, more than 50 miles away. On March 7, 1965, SNCC's John Lewis and the SCLC's Hosea Williams led a procession of more than 500 marchers over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Alabama state troopers, clad in gas masks and riot gear, waited on the other side. It will be detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful assembly. You are ordered to disperse, go home, or go to your church. This march will not continue. News cameras immortalized the hellish scene of police brutality and chaos. Images of Bloody Sunday shocked the nation. Time magazine reported that rarely in human history has public opinion reacted so spontaneously and with such fury. Welcome back to Voices from the Village. Um, you just saw a clip um, from our producer, Ken Nobler, and he uh, <clears throat> wanted to share that because it was kind of, as you saw in the quote there at the very end, a very galvanizing public opinion um, changing moment. And I think we could all acknowledge that King was a real master at, at a kind of mobilizing that public opinion and, and gaining sympathy for his causes. Um, kind of through his capacity and his, you know, the people that work with him, the capacity to, to really struggle and, and face mm -hmm. head-on injustice. Um, reactions, gentlemen? Well, I think uh, one point that always needs to be made whenever we talk about Dr. King is to, in acknowledging his significance as an individual and an outstanding individual, uh, to also recognize that he was a spokesperson, mm -hmm. and he was as as much shaped by the movement as he was the shaper of the rhetoric and the um, literal and figurative target of of, of a lot of uh, that movement. He was also very much a responder mm -hmm. uh, to different kinds of initiatives that were taken from below. Uh, and that's what made that movement so powerful, that, that it, was, um, it was not just about someone who sat in front of a camera or who stood at the head of a march. It was the dialogue. It was the sacrifice. It was the things that happened behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. It was the risks that were shared. Um, and, and that's what makes a movement. Mm -hmm. A movement is more than the sum of its parts. I mean, it's, it's, and, it, and it is always more than the one person who uh, sometimes becomes uh, the person that the media focuses on. Right. Um, but one still really needs to study Dr. King mm -hmm. because he's just, he was a phenomenal mm 
uh, world historical person, mm -hmm. you know, one of the greatest leaders not only in the 20th century but ever. Yep. Um, right. Because of the manner in which he was able to give voice and shape uh, to that movement and the courage that he showed by putting his life and in fact the lives of all of those around him on the line. Um, so mm -hmm. that's, that's something that you just don't see every day. Yeah. But you did see it among all the people who were, um, who were shown, Reverend C.T. Vivian, mm -hmm. John Lewis, um, Hosea Williams, all of those leaders had the same that's right. courage. You know, and, and that's what made it, again, a movement, that it was, it was made up of, of people who had reached the point where they said, um, you know, whatever we have to risk, we just have to take it. Mm -hmm. You know, we just have to take that risk because we're not going to continue to let things happen as they have. We're not going along with the program, mm -hmm. uh, even if that means that yeah. we will get hurt, some of us may die, we'll go to jail, whatever. Um, and and that's, that's the inspiration that I think a lot of people draw from that, you know, that kind of courage. Yeah. There are <coughs> a lot of um, sources of that courage. <coughs> the, one of the things that's uh, unique about that particular uh, time, that particular period in movement, is that it was a time when the, ch the, the black uh, churches, the black church, uh, was um, uh, at its, and the pastors uh, were at the sort of uh, peak of their influence. And, uh, and that it was a willingness to, to give up their lives for the greater good, uh, Allah, <laughs> yeah. uh, as, as Martin said, uh, I want to be known uh, not as, a, as the uh, Nobel Prize winner, but just uh, uh, a Baptist pastor mm -hmm. that was willing to, uh, that tried to love somebody, put that on my, on my tombstone. And the love was potentially at the cost. John Lewis, uh, following on what you were just saying, John Lewis was actually, and, and C.T. Vivian, were much more involved in, the, uh, in that uh, struggle in the South than Martin. And it was Lewis that uh, invited King to, and was almost insisted that, uh, that King step up and, uh, uh, and take his leadership in, in that movement. My own, <clears throat> you know, for, it was several years, uh, San Dino, before I began uh, uh, sharing, and I haven't shared it very often, uh, my, the story of my own uh, involvement in Selma and, uh, and the uh, Formation or the struggle of the uh, Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party, Freedom Democratic Party. Um, but um, uh, what you saw there uh, on the screen, uh, the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson, was uh, uh, Jimmy was uh, James was uh, a resident of Marion, Alabama which is about 20 miles from, um, from Selma. And about three or four days, three days I think, after Jimmy Lee Jackson was, uh, was killed, uh, was when I went from Selma to, uh, to Marion and uh, was the only white person uh, that uh, was in attendance or went to um, a voter registration rally that was being held uh, that night in uh, uh, the AME Zion Church 
and had the, I won't, uh, I'll be brief, but it was the most profound and intense conversations that I've ever had in my life with uh, Southern uh, whites who knew. I mean, they were very, very clear. This was, again, I was the only, only Northern or the only white, and uh, uh, they let it be known that, that they knew where Jackson was buried, and uh, it could, this is, it was not necessarily an isolated incident. Uh, it could happen at any time and to it's anyone. A huge campaign of terror. That's that right. Right alongside the social so the, movements. Even though there were, uh, you know, the the four little girls and there there are individuals who are who stand out in our minds. The man with whom I stayed in Selma, who opened his home to me, was a single gentleman of probably. 75, going on 80 years. I uh, had uh, two rooms. They were hardly rooms. Dirt floor, and uh, and when uh, they were looking for a room for me in the Selma, uh, he invited me. He took me to his home. He could easily uh, have lost his life over that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the and the threat was very real. It wasn't uh, a soap <laughs> opera or, you know, a melodrama. Yeah. People were... Uh, this was real violence. That's right. Um, and I think for that reason, <clears throat> it uh, solidified mm. the resistance to that in the nation. And there were a lot of people in the North who had no idea whatever. I mean, you know, uh, what the Jim Crow uh, experience in the South was. Likewise, a lot of, of uh, black people who uh, from the South uh, who discovered a different variety, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the sweatshops you mentioned uh, in the North and, uh, and the uh, urban poverty and so on that, that continues. I'm, I'm just to curious, our day, to this day. I'm just curious. Something you said uh, that uh, you know you were the only white person yes. in, in the crowd and kind of at the I guess the memorial service. Right. What 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 did that feel like? Because I feel like I often feel that being like the only brown person in a right. crowd. And so right. you know, very. I, I think it's a it's a it's good experience. It's a good experience to have that happen for everyone, where you really feel like the minority all of a sudden. Or you I feel like the, the, the different. In the afternoon, and I'm just curious, just to follow up, like with know. these forty rednecks sure. who just came out of the uh, out of the woods, so to speak, out of the country, mm -hmm. because they uh, they knew that I was in the, uh, the this conversation was going on with a few people at the drugstore, but that was in the afternoon before the civil rights rally, the voter rights uh, rally, the registration rally. I was the minority among the whites. I was absolutely safe and felt entirely welcome yeah. uh, among the, uh, the black people who were registered to vote. There were probably 300 uh, in, the, uh, in the church in, in, uh, in Marion that night. Uh, likewise, who were taking their risk uh, churches were being bombed by something like 22,000. The Methodist pastor uh, of that congregation, of the congregation across the street, the white congregation, uh, lost his pulpit uh, by my coming into uh, to Selma. He had thought he'd be, uh, his family had, uh, had gone up to uh, one of the northern, uh, one of the northern Alabama towns, or uh, Charlotte, I think they went to, uh, but um, he he had just been uh, saying <laughs> the the obvious truth, and uh, he lost his pulpit for it. Um, <clears throat> I do believe we have uh, another video, or possibly even two uh, clips of just kind of. Um, I believe these are clips of King speaking, um, but I know our 
uh, director has another clip or two lined up. So why don't we go to another video and then we'll come back and do some reactions to that. Okay. Maybe some tear gas ahead. Yeah. I say to you this afternoon that I would rather die on the highways of Alabama than make a butchery of my conscience. Yes, sir. say to you as we march, don't panic and remember that we must remain true to nonviolence. I'm asking everybody in the line, if you can't be nonviolent, don't get in it. If you can't accept blows without out retaliating, don't get in the line. If you can accept, accept it out of your commitment to nonviolence, you will somehow do something for this nation that may well save. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long. Yes, sir. Because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long? Not long. How long? Because you shall reap what you sow. There you go again. Uh, the powerful words of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, something that struck me about that last video was kind of his invitation to people to participate in what he identified correctly as important work. Right. Um, talk about that about King, that he, he really seemed to invoke participation. Uh, yeah. D David, Darrell, either, either one of you two? Well, or, or just any reactions to the video as well? Uh, I, you know, he is, he, he is the product of a tradition uh, that is epitomized in call and response. You mm -hmm. know, the, the ways in which you listen to him speak to people, and particularly when he's sermonizing, and how people respond. You know, people say yes, or you know, say it, or whatever, um, is, is also kind of a model of, of how the movement mm -hmm. operates, in that everybody has a role, everybody has a responsibility. Nobody goes there to just look. You may bear witness, but if you bear witness, it is an invitation to action. Um, and uh, you know that's that's one of the striking features of it. But I wanted to say something very quickly. Um, Darrell's talked about his relationship to the movement in the period of 1965 uh, with Selma. Uh, there are a lot of things leading up to that that I was thinking about in relation to this. I was thinking about the the lynching of Emmett Till in 1955, which was a decade before that, and how when he was lynched and his body was um, dredged out of uh, the river in Money, Mississippi. One thing that was said was, oh, there are lots of people in that river, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of what you were saying. Yeah. Um, but I was also thinking about listening to Dr. King in, in terms of my own um, experience. Dr. King was an internationalist. Uh, in in every sense. Uh, in 1957, he was part of a, a group of African American notables, including um, Ralph Bunch and Adam Clayton Powell and a bunch of other people who were invited to attend the independence celebrations for Gold Coast as it became Ghana under its first prime minister, Kwame Nkrumah. So he was there. He was mm -hmm. in Africa on the spot. He was also very much involved in the democratic movement for South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and when I reached the age of majority, when I was in college, I became interested in the anti-apartheid movement. When I got to, um, to graduate school, I got involved in um, something called the Madison Area Committee on Southern Africa in the University of Wisconsin, where I was. I was involved in that movement in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Um, and I saw that as simply an extension of 
the movement uh, in this country, mm. which was also unfolding at a time of international consciousness. It was, it was still the time of the Cold War. It was the time of Vietnam. There were lots of things. But in the same way that earlier movements gave rise to other movements of uh, democratic upsurge, you could see people who were involved in that movement also got involved in other kinds of liberation movements. This was also the period of the resurgence of the women's movement, the feminist movement. This was the rise of um, movements like um, the Young Lords in New York, the Black Panther Party, uh, Brown Berets. the Brown Berets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of these movements were developing in, in, in that period. So one of the things that you see is that any movement that speaks to the needs of one people very often resonates with a whole lot of other people because you're not talking just about one mm -hmm. narrow group, you are talking about humanity. Okay. Uh, and you were starting off talking about this transition from civil rights to human rights. Right. And I think you can really see it in many of these movements. You can also see it in the evolution of the consciousness of someone like Malcolm X. I was about because to Malcolm say, X talks was... about that in the last years of his life. Mm -hmm. And then 20 years later, a president by the name of James Earl Carter talks about human rights. Mm -hmm. right. Now, how did that happen? Right. You know, it was a very interesting development. Yeah, the <clears throat> on, <laughs> on one hand, we've come so far that we have uh, uh, we had a decision between uh, electing a woman president uh, or a black president. So we've we've come that distance, and at the same time we have uh, the the dark side, uh, which is primarily an, an economic uh, uh, side. Uh, of not just, uh, it, it still has strong racial uh, roots. You know, the fact that there are, uh, there is such an overwhelming number of, uh, of black young male, young men who are in prison uh, for crimes, some, some not even for crimes, but much less uh, serious uh, breaches than uh, the, uh, the normal white uh, breach yeah. uh, or, or crime. The, uh, I'd, lo I'd love to read something here and just get you guys' yeah. reactions okay. because this article really spoke to me as, you know, we just passed the Martin Luther King holiday. Um, you know, there's been a kind of sanitization of, of Dr. King, if you will, and his message, which was against militarism, poverty, and racism, right? We love to celebrate his struggle against racism, but we forget he spoke out powerfully against the Vietnam right. War. We forget he was organizing the Poor People's March on Washington, you know, in the months before he was assassinated. And so this is a, a piece that, I, that really spoke to me in all of, of, of this kind of celebration of King. I think it's a great thing, but we need to remember, and that's the title of the piece, that Martin Luther King was a radical, not a saint. This is published on commondreams.org, a fabulous website, um, collecting a lot of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, the author is Peter Dreyer, and I'm just gonna read an excerpt, and I'd like to hear you guys respond. He's talking about the King holiday, and that's a great thing. But then he continues, so it's easy to forget that in his day, in his own country, King was considered a dangerous troublemaker. He was harassed by the FBI and vilified in the media. In fact, King was a radical. He believed that America needed a radical redistribution of economic and political power. He challenged America's class system and its racial, its racial caste system. He was a strong ally of the nation's labor union movement. He was assassinated in April 1968 in Memphis, where he had gone to support a sanitation workers' strike. He opposed U.S. militarism and imperialism, especially the country's misadventure in Vietnam. In his critique of American society and his strategy for changing it, King pushed the country towards, a more, towards more democracy and social justice. If he were alive today, he would certainly be standing with Walmart employees and other workers fighting for a living wage and the right to unionize. He would be in the forefront of the battle for strong gun controls and to thwart the influence of the National Rifle Association. He would be calling for dramatic cuts in the military budget in order to reinvest public dollars in jobs, education, and health care. He would surely be marching with immigrants and their allies in support of the DREAM Act, 
and comprehensive immigration reform. Like most Americans in his day, King was homophobic, even though one of his closest advisors, Bayard Rustin, was gay. But today, King would undoubtedly be standing with advocates of LGBT rights and same-sex marriage. Yep, I agree, I agree. But we should also remember that uh, Jesus Christ was uh, considered right. to be an enemy of the state. <laughs> right. You know? Uh, uh, that's, I was thinking exactly the same thing, David. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jesus' statement. Can you be a radical saint, though? What? Well, uh, saints oh, sure. are really, <laughs> sure. really, well, really... It's not either or, right? Let's be we both. Just we need about more of both. I want to say something before we close. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we got about we've, five we've minutes. Been talking about okay. this, we've been talking about this movement, but one of the giants of this movement is actually coming to this town mm. in a couple of days. Mm. His name is Robert Moses, Bob Moses. Right. Uh, one of the founders of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a uh, very, very important person who's going to be speaking uh, at the Civic mm. on uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Convocation. Martin Luther King Convocation, which right. I believe is the sixth. Um, and that's free, and it's a priceless opportunity. Always he is a great about event. 80 now. Wow. Uh, and he's a person who has always stayed out of the limelight, um, but that's deceptive. Uh, because he's, mm -hmm. he really, in many ways, epitomizes um, that struggle in Mississippi. Now, we're talking about some of the, the sort of modern uh, civil rights issues. He's always been a math teacher. Um, and he created something called the Algebra Project because he said, you know, innumeracy is the problem of our period in the same way that illiteracy was back in the 1960s. And if you think about how lots of kids run into difficulty around middle school, it's algebra that they uh, have problems with. And I some people just, <laughs> and some people Certainly. do not finish. Yeah. You know, they do not yeah. do well. Yeah. So, um, so he has actually built an entire program around that. And now that's an extraordinary for somebody who was involved in voter rights, you know, somebody who was, um, who was nurtured by one of the greatest organizers in the 20th century, Hella Baker. Um, you know, so this is how he has progressed in, in, uh, in his thinking and in his practice. So what we talk about as civil rights is not just something that is captured on film from the 50s and the right. 60s. This is not a museum piece. It continues. You know, it is the struggle continues. You mentioned the ra that Jesus was radical. He was an absolute <laughs> off the charts feminist. You know, you read you read his interactions that the, that even the guys, you know, the gospel writers who made it into the canon uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, particularly John to a lesser, well, no, John too. Uh, but the, the men told the stories. The men were the disciples. Mm -hmm. What did the men say? The men said, uh, told the stories of Jesus just um, totally illegal, totally anti-saintly <laughs> interactions publicly with women with the Samaritans, with the outcast, with, with uh, uh, radicals of, of all kinds. His, the crucifixion was Rome's most uh, severe punishment for um, uh, sedition and terrorism. So uh, it's a different, what, what Hillel was about, what, uh, what uh, Gautama Buddha was about, what uh, Jesus was about. Somebody just uh, suggested not long a, a good friend who is a nuclear physicist, and, uh, and I agree with uh, them, uh, husband and wife, that we need a new mythology. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> if we would just take seriously uh, the prophets, as you're saying, a king came out of a movement, but he was also the prophet who articulated the truth was willing to put his life, he staked his life on, on human rights, staked his life on our essential common humanity. Yeah. And that's all that the saints ever did. Jesus, Buddha, all of them. That's, uh, 
that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. The radical saint, you know, the radical, uh, just the radical, the person that's willing to put themselves out there and to challenge that's society right. and to really right. um, go against the norm and, and, and be prepared to, to suffer and to, to struggle as a result. That, that's, to me, it really speaks to the legacy of not only King, but all of the unsung heroes, all of the people who gave their lives for this struggle, you know, Absolutely. we recognize them. And I think that's the best way we could um, recognize them. I think the, the, leg, the, the legacy to me of King is continuing the struggle, of continuing to be involved, continuing. And I want to um, salute both of you gentlemen for, for doing exactly that and for committing your lives to this process and, and to really, um, for everything that you've done, that you will do, and especially for being on our show tonight because we've come, ran out of time. And uh, <laughs> I just want to thank, thank you, you again. On behalf of the, uh, the staff and the volunteers, all the people involved in Voices from the Village here at Community Television, uh, I just want to say thank you and uh, good night.